Ladies and gentlemen, the presentation is starting. Sal, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is Sal Salamone from Ziff Davis Enterprise, and uh, thanks for joining us today for our web seminar. And to get us off, we're going we're gonna to get started in about a minute, but before we go, we wanted to make sure this was as interactive as possible, so we're going to ask you uh, a couple of questions at the beginning. So we're pushing out our first poll right now. And given the topic, uh, F5 solution for Microsoft Exchange 2010, and looking at uh, high availability issues, we'd like to at least know uh, what, who's out there, like how many email users do you have? So please select um, the, the most suitable answer here. Just pick one. You might need to turn off your pop-up blocker to uh, participate. So again, how many email users do you have? Here are 500, 501 to 1,000, all the way up. And uh, as you're uh, filling this out, uh, we're, we're letting a few attendees now just join. And it'll, like I said, we'll get started in about one minute. Okay, we're having some uh, the poll results are tabulating. And now um, I'd like to just formally welcome everyone today. Again, my name is Sal Salamone. I'm an executive editor at Ziff Davis Enterprise. Thank you for joining us for our web seminar, F5 Solution for Microsoft Exchange 2010. Uh, our event today is sponsored by F5 Networks and Microsoft. Um, one of the things we're looking at, or hopefully you'll take away from this, is some of the ways to uh, address uh, high availability, uh, make your sites more resilient and, and address disaster recovery issues, and also look at some deployment and migration issues. Uh, we're going to be joined today by two speakers and perhaps a guest speaker here or there. Uh, uh, to start, we have uh, James Hendergaard, who's Business Development Manager at F5 Networks. James, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks a lot, Sal. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. And um, before I get you, let you get started, again, I want to remind people, this is a very interactive event. Uh, we'll have some polls throughout, and we encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation by hitting the Ask a Question button. And also, your slides will be available for download at the end, so if you'd rather, um, rather than scribbling notes furiously throughout, you can uh, listen and have a copy of the slides after. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, James. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. It's my pleasure to be here to talk to you about the F5 solution for Microsoft Exchange 2010. Today uh, we have with us a guest, David Zazzo from Microsoft Corporation. He's a senior infrastructure and messaging consultant and also Exchange certified master. Hey, Dave, why don't you say hi? Thanks, James. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as James said, my name is David Zazzo. I am a senior consultant with Microsoft Consulting Services. And what I do as part of my role at MCS is certainly provide design and architecture guidance for our large enterprise customers, um, certainly around Exchange 2010 in, in, in simple and very complex designs, as well as my role as a, as a Microsoft Certified Master in Exchange 2010 is providing technical quality assurance uh, for our different projects and design projects to ensure that our customers are getting the highest quality deliverables as well as a solution that will meet their needs. Excellent. Thank you. And we also have a very special guest today, um, Mr. Arthur Brown from Sysmex Corporation. Arthur, why don't you say hello? Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm the IT manager here at Sysmex, and uh, we are currently running F5s for our front-end hardware load balancing for Exchange 2010. Thank you very much. So uh, Art's generously offered to come and talk with us a little bit today about his experience uh, with Exchange and with Big IP. And uh, so we're going to be getting to him uh, a little bit later in the presentation, so you can look forward to that. My role at F5 is actually to spend time with Microsoft working on solutions that integrate the Microsoft platform and in this case, today's topic is Change 2010 with F5's platform on Big IP. And then also to work with customers and partners to understand exactly how to think about where the Big IP fits in these designs. 
so it's my pleasure today to go ahead and start to kick off uh, this session with one more poll. So Sal, what we're going to do now is I want you to pick up that um, exchange version poll and we'll kick that out to everyone and then we'll get on into the rest of the session. All right, we'll be doing that. And um, you should be seeing this in your window. Uh, we just, again, just get a, a, an assessment of who's in the crowd, um, what people are using. What version of Exchange are you running today? And just pick one, uh, answer either 2003, 2007, 2010, uh, a combination, so multiple, or none. And we'll let the results tally for a second. And uh, again, as I said, please submit questions throughout. We'll have some time at the end for Q&A. And now, do we want to uh, take a quick look at the results here, James? That'd be perfect, Sal. And if we haven't already shown everyone the answers for users and version, let's do that now. Okay. So we'll put them up back to back. So why don't we look at the first poll? So uh, how many email users? So uh, good distribution. Uh, what do you? Sweet spot, thousand to five thousand. That seems pretty common. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah. Absolutely. This is actually a great set of results. So uh, what I can tell all of you, no matter what size of organization you're running today, um, we have something for you. We have something for you in our presentation. And uh, it's really interesting to see the larger number of mm -hmm. 1,000 to 5,000 size companies because obviously those companies have moved beyond the, the uh, beginning stages of their development and they're maturing. And over the next few years, those could be the companies that are breaking out into the over 10,000 seat, you know, uh, organizations. And that's, uh, that means that this audience is very well in tune with the need to make very sober and careful investments in IT uh, to support the growth of their business. So you guys are in for a great presentation today. I'm looking forward to it. So let's move on to the next one, Sal. So let's take a look at the second poll result. And this was what version of Exchange are you running today? And uh, boy, split right down the middle. <laughs> How does that jive with what you're seeing out there? Absolutely, and, and you know, as we've seen, as we've seen through some analyst projections, as compared to actual adoption rates mm -hmm. for Exchange 2010, customers are moving to 2010 now, right? And so a lot of customers are have already moved, or they're in the process of migrating from one of the earlier versions of Exchange up to 2010. So this is mm -hmm. a really um, great time to be talking about it. And what this means is that uh, we definitely have ears tuned to these particular uh, deployment projects, and we have people ready to help these customers take advantage of all of the great um, you know, features and cost savings mm -hmm. that are available in 2010. Um, David, do you have any comments about exchange adoption and, and these numbers? Uh, no, I actually I think this is this is pretty much what we're seeing in the field. Um, you know, from from Microsoft, I'm I'm actually more encouraged to see uh, you know an equal or actually slightly higher number of 2010 adoption already in place uh, versus 2003. I think in in, in some of the larger 50,000 seats and above environments, we probably still see a lot of 2003 in the environment, mm. uh, and that could be part of the multiple as well. Um, but it's encouraging to see the uh, the rapid uptick there. Right. All right. Well, thanks, Saul. I appreciate that. We're ready to jump into the mainline content now. Appreciate your help with those. Uh, with I'll those join polls. you later. <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. So let's take a look at our agenda today. We've got three main portions of content to go through, and we're going to spend the first section of our time on what's new in Exchange 2010 and why think about client access and F5 networks together. Secondly, we're going to go through an overview at a high level of some of the key features in Microsoft's application-ready solution for Exchange, and then um, move on from there to some specific areas around site resiliency and global traffic management, as well as um, access authentication authorization, and then some deployment helps uh, within our platform that can help you understand how easy it is to put a big IP in place with Exchange. So with that, let's jump into that first portion, what's new around Exchange 2010. So we'll set this up by um, just really letting you know that in, in Exchange 2010, there was an architecture change from Microsoft. And this is something that David's going to be talking about in just a minute. And this architecture change elevates really the prominence of the client access server in Exchange. It's one of the several Exchange roles. And um, I believe it was started in Exchange 2007 was the first time that role was named. But anyway, uh, at this point, what we're seeing in 2010 is that all client connections, all types of connections into Exchange to retrieve information from the inbox and from the calendar 
regardless of protocol, are with these CAS servers. And these CAS servers really do rely on application delivery controllers like F5 Big IP for high availability. And so with that quick intro, I'm going to turn it over to David now. So David, why don't you walk through uh, this particular description in a little bit more detail and explain to everyone uh, what's happening. Certainly. Thanks, James. So when we look at, um, I'm trying to figure out how to get to the next slide here. Here we go. So, so James, you're right. When, when we looked at Exchange 2007, is, is really the first version that we introduced the pure client access server. But it wasn't quite that pure. Um, you know, certainly CAS server front ends, your Outlook web app, your, your Exchange control panel, Exchange Active Sync, web services, auto discover, everything that we can see there on the slide for all the different protocols that we, that we handle. And then on the other side of the CAS server, we do our RPC back to the mailbox server to get the mail. We do our, our, our global catalog lookups. And then we also talk to other CAS servers if we have to do some cross-site proxying and that sort of thing. The big change here is this box at the bottom, which is the RPC client access service. And I've got a slide that helps illustrate this here um, two slides later. But essentially, as James mentioned, what we've done is we've moved every single client access or all client access to the middle tier. <clears throat> and so what are some, some of the reasons why we did that? Certainly, um, as we look at the new database availability group, um, you know, kind of uh, high availability strategies in 2010, we wanted to help insulate the client experience from a database switchover or a failover, right? In 2007, if you're running a cluster continuous replication, um, you know, CCR cluster, when you have to fail that cluster over, the clients get disconnected, right? Because in 2007 and previous versions, the client was directly connected to the mailbox. And so you'd see a little pop-up in Outlook saying, yep, we got disconnected, we're trying to trying to communicate again, and sometimes that can lead to, to impatient users, help desk tickets, and you know, so on and so forth. So we wanted to provide a better client experience so that the Outlook connection itself doesn't drop. We wanted to use the same business logic. If you've ever run uh, you know, Exchange for probably some length of time, and you might have third-party devices in there, or even just Outlook itself, sometimes we can get calendar problems, right? If you've ever had to run a calendar repair tool, or you've had uh, you know, calendar details go missing, or calendar items go missing, um, you know, some of that had to do with the way we did the data validation in the client level rather than the middle tier. Some of the work we did for compliance, for the archive mailbox infrastructure, um, we really needed to move more logic to the client access server rather than have it sitting on the mailbox server itself. Scaling mailbox connections, right? When we looked at, at Exchange 2003 and Exchange 2007, specifically on Windows Server 2003, we could run into some limitations on how many client connections we can, we, we can maintain at any given time. And a lot of that you know, manifested itself with, with non-page pool exhaustion in, in, in Windows Server 2003. Some of it had to do with RPC over proxy connections. Uh, you know, with that 65,000 uh, connection limitation per IP address, we really wanted to find a way to scale the mailbox connections. And so we made a lot of improvements in client access server tier um, in Exchange 2010, as well as leveraging the improvements that we had in, in Windows Server 2008 to help scale our mailbox uh, connections better and provide more availability and a better user experience to the, to the end users. Um, certainly, as we move more code out of information store, it makes the information store a little leaner and meaner. And so the mailbox store is actually just a mailbox store. It doesn't have to worry about how to expose the RPC interface to client access or, or to, to, to clients. It doesn't have to worry about having the data validation uh, logic I had in there before. And then we also now introduced middle tier throttling. This was something that we introduced primarily for a public cl cloud scenario, but also for the on-premises scenario as well, which is, you know, a misbehaving client shouldn't impact everybody else on that server. Um, a misbehaving device or mobile device implementation shouldn't impact some of our other, other clients because that's just not fair. So we wanted to make sure that we had some middle tier throttling. I mentioned a little bit about um, some of the data validation and code paths. If we looked at 2007, <clears throat> this is kind of what we had, right? So Outlook Web Access, some of the other Exchange components like ActiveSync, Unified Messaging, Exchange Web Services all went through the middle tier, right? The CAS server in 2007. We had some business logic there, and then we did our MAP ERPC back to the back end. But you can see that Outlook still talked directly to the back end server using MAP ERPC. So a lot of that business logic had to be implemented at the Outlook level. And then Entourage for the Mac and, and other third-party applications used the WebDAV interface. 
So again, all that validation and the, and, and the business logic had to be implemented in those clients. And generally speaking, as you have multiple teams and multiple vendors and multiple partners working on different products, some of that can be implemented differently. So the fundamental change we made in Exchange Server 2010 here on the right-hand side is everything now, as we've said before, goes through the middle tier. So the MAPI RPC interface for Outlook lives on the middle tier. Entourage no longer talks web dev, so if you haven't deployed 2010 yet and you are using the web dev protocol, that no longer exists in Exchange Server 2010. So something to keep in mind for your application compatibility. And then OA and Exchange Web Services, you know, uh, Auto Discover, Active Sync still uses the same logic, but then we've wedged in this core business logic that does our, our, our calendar checking, our, our, our validation, and then map the RPC back to the store. So why all of this is important and, and really what we're talking about today is if the client access is right in the middle of everything, then that's really the layer that we have to worry about when it comes to high availability and fault tolerance. Now, nice little build graphic, right? Outlook, all the clients talk to CAS, CAS talks to the mailbox servers, and it's this CAS role that really is where the F5 LTM and, and the, really the F5 big IP products come into play for ensuring that users are, are, you know, connected to a different CAS server if a CAS server should fall over, to make sure that your load is being balanced appropriately across all your CAS servers, again, to help drive a positive user experience and minimal outage or downtime or experience of downtime as much as possible. With that, back to you, James. Great. Thank you, David, for that explanation. That was perfect. In fact, uh, you've made it very easy on me to uh, bring up this next slide, which basically says the same thing in a little different format. So I want to summarize all this by explaining to people that, you know, as you're looking to move to Exchange 2010, you have these new options for client ca connectivity, right? We're talking about Outlook um, uh, Anywhere, which is R RPC over HTTP. Um, we have the Outlook Web Client. We have, um, you know, the strict MAPI client for full Outlook. We've got the, you know, the Entourage clients. All of those different protocols, including even those of you who might be using instant messaging or different pieces of client software that do address book lookups, right, all coming into Exchange CAS. Um, and, that, and then on top of that, the mobile users, right? So you've got these mobile users, and on our slide here, it's sort of in the lower left-hand corner. You have all these users coming in through you see the F5 big IP right there in the middle, the black box with the red F5 on it, um, into the client access server. And so um, that's the place in the architecture where those boxes will sit. And then we'll, what we'll do is we'll uh, discuss a little bit later a little bit more about um, network zones because what uh, we find is that depending on the feature sets the customers are leveraging from F5, they may be doing some work in the perimeter network or the internal network. Um, and so, uh, you know, as you get through the deeper questions of your actual architecture design, where you place your CAS servers and where your firewalls are, then the options for Big IP become evident for doing uh, virtualized networking to allow the, uh, one Big IP to serve both zones or to place them in each of the zones. So with that, let's uh, just go forward here and summarize the actual um, message. So you look at the connection here that's not happening directly to the mailbox. That's what we're happen saying is that the client access server is that primary uh, communication channel right here. And so that CAS server is the key topology point for the F5 um, device. Okay, now what we're saying is that uh, these application delivery controllers are things that the CAS servers recommend, are recommended for and that even um, Microsoft after a year of deploying Exchange is really saying, hey, take a look at your options for uh, scaling out your CAS servers. You have software and you have hardware options, but the, so the primary software option being Windows NLB um, may not actually be able to be used in the same way that you've used it in the past. So now we're going to transition into a conversation around Windows NLB uh, because it's an offering uh, from Microsoft that is really designed for a stateless um, web type applications with packets that are very similar. Um, which is a little bit different than the way that um, Exchange client traffic normally uh, moves. And so let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the way that you need to think about availability and why we're talking about a hardware appliance, okay? And so uh, moving on from there, what we're saying is that the, the uh, Windows NLB for Exchange is um, 
can be um, something that's problematic when you're talking about trying to get a view of the health of the Exchange server. And so um, that's why it's great to have David here with me because I'm going to deliver this message and, and then ask David to comment a little bit about how he sees um, this particular software option versus the, the hardware option. So the main points that you need to remember is that in, in earlier versions of Exchange, you might be using some web connections that, that um, weren't necessarily needing a stateful connection as possible or you just weren't scaling out like you um, are needing to do today with so many client connections coming into CAS. But what happens with NLB is that it's knowing whether or not there's a network level connection, but not whether or not there's a, an application layer connection. And I'm going to put up a slide in a few minutes to describe that in more detail. To detail. And secondly, this idea about applications that have stateful connection requirements versus stateless. Exchange connections need to be stateful, which means you need to have access to your calendar and to your inbox. While you're typing an email or running through your inbox looking for something or trying to view calendar details, you don't want that session interrupted. You don't want to need to re-authenticate to the CAS server. And so there are some uh, benefits to using a hardware solution that allow you to persist that connection for a user to give them a good response from the start of their email session until the end. And that can be as short as, you know, a few seconds for a user popping into their inbox to find the room number for a meeting, and it can be as long as all day, right, because many of us keep Outlook open run, running all day long. And that same principle applies regardless of client, whether you're using a mobile device or you're using a PC at your desk. Okay? Now, um, David, I'm going to pop up one more slide here that just gives them a reference to the uh, load balancing recommendations from a TechEd presentation. And uh, we're, not, we're not asking everyone to read this slide. What I'm doing is giving you a screenshot of this slide so that you recognize a video posted to the web. This is a Microsoft resource, and the URL is available um, from ZIF uh, in the resources section of this presentation online. Um, but what we're showing is a link and a video. So if you skip to minute 47 and 48 seconds of this video, you get to the load balancing recommendation pieces for Exchange. And so for those of you who are specifically looking for some, you know, third-party substantiation for the things I'm talking about in your decision whether to use a hardware device or using a software solution for high availability of CAS, um, this is the place. So, David, now, now for um, a bit of levity, go ahead, and, and I'd like to get your opinion on, you know, what are you seeing in the field and where are customers um, finding that they need to make a decision to go to a hardware device? Sure, sure, absolutely. So. As, as James had mentioned, you know, there, Windows Network load balancing has been in the box, uh, I think, since, I don't know, Windows Server 2003 Enterprise Edition, I think, is when it was first really introduced. But it's actually been around since the NT4 option pack, if you go back that far, or Application Center 2000. And, and, and with it, when we, when we look at the Exchange environment, or, or really the, the number of workloads that Exchange has to manage, and if you look at that, you know, go back to that first slide I had, or think back to the first slide I had of all those different protocols, we have to manage those or, or, or load balance them um, kind, kind of differently from one another is, is, is one of the things that, that we have to do with, with, with CAS. And so when we look at each of those workloads and, and how to best balance those, Windows NLB, uh, you know, while, while supported by the you know, by, by Microsoft and, and Premier support really falls up short in a lot of those ways. When we look at, um, you know, the health check, as, as, as James mentioned, it's really a ping, right? And so the machine could be up, the TCP IP stack could be up, but Exchange would be completely toast, and you'd have no idea, and, and in fact, you'd be sending users there. Um, from, from a persistence, right, which is kind of the stateful connection idea, when we only do source IP persistence or affinity using using Windows Network Load Balancing, there's some challenges with that, right? If we have a lot of our clients behind NAT devices, right, network address translation devices, then there, there, there could be 10,000 clients sitting behind a single NAT IP address. We're only going to look at the one IP address as being, you know, where connections are coming from. And so one of your CAS servers will, will, will get the brunt of that load, while maybe three or four other CAS servers are sitting there bored uh, because they're not getting any traffic. So source IP affinity does cause us some problems um, in, those, in, in those style environments. And since 
since Windows Network Load Balancing can't take advantage of cookie-based or SSL session ID or some of the other uh, persistence methods that we have with, with F5 devices, that's where we can run into some, into some really load imbalance problems. The Exchange Product Group guidance for Windows Network Load Balancing is, is a maximum of, of eight nodes, and that's really kind of the high-end um, environment. And, and if you've got a, an Exchange environment of scale, you may or may not have more than eight CAS servers, and so that's another option or, or another scenario where network load balancing really doesn't work. I think the product could support up to, I don't know, 24 or 32. We absolutely don't recommend doing that. Um, the Exchange Product Group guidance is anything less than eight. Um, and even with eight, if you've ever run NLB in those environments, we've, we have some challenges around switch port flooding. We have some problems with convergence, right? If I take a machine down, we break all of the connections. Well, how is that load balancing and fault tolerance if whenever a machine goes down, every connection is severed to the pool? Um, so there's a couple of reasons there that, that when our customers look at Windows Network Load Balancing as a way to, to, to do exchange, they start diving into some of, these, some of these caveats that we have with it. and you know, I, I, for me, re trying to recommend Windows Network Load Balancing, you know, to a to a you know medium to, to large enterprise customer, and saying, well, yeah, you know, we can do this. It's in the box, except that if we try to do this and you take a machine out of out of service to to patch it or or to update it, then all of a sudden you lose all your client connections. That's that, that's a pretty big showstopper for it, um, and that sort of thing. And then certainly. You know, the, like I said, the convergence, some of our, our, our eight node maximums, you know, my current customer has something like 40 of them. So that's not going to work out very well. And then as we look at some of the newer guidance that's starting to come out from the product group around an all-in-one system or where we, would, where we can co-locate the, the mailbox server role in a DAG, in a database availability group, as well as the client access server role, one of the challenges that we have today is network load balancing is not supported from a Windows product level along with Windows failover clustering, which is what drives your database availability group. So in those environments, you can't actually use Windows NLB along with your DAG. And again, that points us back to the F5 big IP devices to really help fill that gap where Windows network load balancing comes up short. Great. Thank you, David. Um, that's a great explanation. So if you have guys have questions about that, when you're going back and you're looking over the slides, we definitely have all the links here in the content to help you decide um, which camp you're in. Do you, do you need to have seamless maintenance? Do you need to have a full high availability? Is your email a critical business app? Um, for most of you, probably it is. Um, and then do you have these requirements for persistence, stateful, stateful persistence and responsiveness from email? So what we're going to do is give you an overview now of exactly what those pains are that you will, you'll face um, if you're not having this kind of high availability. So think about these pains in the top of the slide. Users having to re-authenticate, sessions being dropped, failed network connections, and slow response. Those are all things that are served uh, through the capabilities of the F5 solution and get you beyond those challenges. And now what we're going to do is jump into a description of what some of those features are. So for those of you who are looking for a little more detail, um, here we go. So the F5 uh, solution for Exchange really covers a feature set that goes through um, both availability and performance areas as well as uh, management and security. And so we're going to talk about all four of those areas today, um, and we've got slides to back up the content so that as I go through this to you um, audibly, you can refer back to these slides and remember what we're talking to you about um, during uh, this particular live session. So let's go ahead and go through these now. Availability. So what, what does this mean? Availability means how do, you, how do you make Exchange available to all users all the time? And the, from the F5 perspective, being a company that is an expert in application delivery networking, okay, that's where can the network optimize the delivery of an application and make sure that it is as available as possible. What you're really talking about is the ability to do effective monitoring, health monitoring of an application. All right, we take the health monitoring information that we do and we build a table in our device in memory. And that table is up, so in real time, in real time, uh, we can actually decide which of those, or determine which of those exchange servers is most available and ensure that customers are having an application experience that's good. 
before we send traffic. So take a look at um, this particular graphic that I want to show you. This graphic illustrates how we're able to actually ensure that users are never ever sent to a server that's down and that we're able to do that within a site or even across sites. What we do is we do a multi-port and protocol health check. And a, one good example would be with a web type client, we check at the TCP level, like David mentioned, and we check at the HTTP level. And it goes beyond just a simple HTTP GET. There's a number of HTTP messages we can interpret that come back, and you can define a logic that's actually processed in real time in our device to check the status of your exchange service so that you know. You know what your, your user's experience is, maybe even sometimes before they do. And if there's a problem, we're automatically taking that machine and reducing or eliminating its connections so that you always have available servers providing exchange to your users. Okay? The last thing that you want is to think that you have application health monitoring but then you have a user that ends up trapped because there's a network connection that's established, but they can't get any work done and they can't get off the server. We're, we're going to help you around that. So now let's talk a little bit about persistence. Persistence is the concept as giving affinity or stickiness to a server to make sure that a user gets the best experience they can. <clears throat> One good analogy for this would be something like a shopping cart when you're online shopping. At a certain point when you're, sh when you're shopping, you switch from being able to hit any web server to do your shopping, to look at something, to the point where you need a stateful connection that, with your shopping cart to keep track of what items you've selected and how much you're planning to pay for it. So same thing with email. You need to know how to um, connect and keep users on their same server for the duration of their session. Now, <clears throat> Exchange clients have different methods of persistence they support. And David mentioned needing to do things like SSL ID or auth ID or cookie persistence uh, for a mobile user, for example, or excuse me, auth ID would be something like for a mobile user, um, cookie persistence for a web-based user. And if you don't have a platform that supports all those different kinds of persistence methods, then you're stuck. You really are stuck. And so what we do is we follow Microsoft's guidance for persistence methods per client connection type. What I'm going to show you right now are a couple of screenshots of the cookie persistence profiles inside the Big IP device. So this UI that you're looking at right now, those are actual pieces of the, the Big IP web UI. And you can see that each of the profiles can be selected from a, a drop-down. <clears throat> right at the bottom of the blue bar on the left side, that text is a persistence type. And that persistence type can be selected. We've got built-in profiles with specific kinds of network settings that we support to allow you to configure that persistence the way you need to. Remember, the big IP device is a full proxy. So we're proxying all these client connections coming in on one side and opening up new network connections back toward the exchange servers. The next topic, which is um, offloading of SSL certificates, opens up a new door. When I, I'm going to introduce that now, saying if we can see the whole packet, we can modify, we can intercept and modify and enhance any of those packets. That's why we can persist off of any data field that's available like an auth ID. Because we're a network device that's designed from the hardware architecture all the way up through our operating system to manage this traffic. So we're looking for traffic on specific ports and protocols and we're performing the actions that are specified for a, a, an application like Exchange very specifically. This might be a good time to note that you know, when we, when we use the phrase F5 solution or F5 solution for exchange, we're not talking about a separate product. It's the same product that you would purchase for the network application delivery of any, um, any other application that you might have over your, your network. What we do is we, we understand how exchange works and we provide and design solutions that configure our device and leverage the very um, robust and flexible platform for managing network traffic to make it exchange intelligent and to run seamlessly at line speed for you so that in a regular LAN or WAN networking environment, we're not adding an appreciable delay to the experience. In fact, we're speeding it up in most cases. So let's go back on to the SSL um, termination piece because offload is another way to impact the availability of CAS. You might be wondering, how in the world can SSL offload impact the availability of my CAS server 
for Exchange running on Windows. By terminating SSL on the Big IP device, you actually reduce the costs of overhead and managing those certs from you know, an operational perspective. The Big IP itself, from a hardware perspective, is designed to do those crypto calculations on a special chipset that's a different than the mainline processor of our device. So even when you take the, the SSL certificate off of our, your exchange servers and place it on the Big IP, it's not actually taxing the main Big IP. It's that special chipset that's designed for those encryption and decryption calculations. There's no more efficient way to do that calculation than on the async chipset of our device. And this, in turn, takes a burden off of the Windows server so that Exchange gets more CPU cycles and can handle more connections per second at the network level to do what? Connect people to their inbox. Because remember, if you can't connect to CAS, you can't get your email in live email. All right, that brings us to the end of this, this uh, uh, first uh, second section. What we're going to do now is jump into the, the site resilience, the security, and the deployment pieces. Before we do that, Sal, I wanted to bring up another poll and yeah. run the, the data center uh, question we have for everyone, okay? Sure, and um, we'll pop that up right now. Again, you might need to disable your pop-up blocker to uh, participate in the poll. And um, very quick and dirty question, how many data centers support your email deployment, including disaster recovery? Just pick the most suitable, uh, just pick one answer, one, two to three, four or more. And uh, as we're tallying up the results, again, just want to remind people, keep sending in questions. Um, and as we noted, the presentation will be available for download after the, the session. And there are also a number of uh, resources that will be, um, so there will be the, uh, one of the links that was mentioned. There will be a number of things available uh, before you leave. So why don't we, um, I think that's enough time, why don't we push out the poll results now. We can take a quick look. Thanks, Sal. I appreciate that. Yeah, we want to take a look to see. It looks like most people are around two to three data centers. Yep. Definitely have a spread there. For those of you who have one data center, we definitely um, don't feel like you, you, can, uh, you can mute um, and take off. Listen up because this is a, we have found that in our, our customer <clears throat> environments, the idea of disaster recovery or resilience, the ability to take a business critical application like Exchange and actually provide a failover um, is actually something that many of you aspire to. And if, if, not, if not this year, then in the future, very soon, you may be. And so this next topic is really going to expand beyond – thank you, Sal. Um, this next uh, topic is going to expand beyond server-level health and single site-level health, uh, which are built on all the concepts we've just covered. And we're actually going to move on now to um, site-level health. So think about everything we've just covered around how the big IP can tell you how healthy exchange is within a particular site. And now we're going to talk about how that we build on that to extend to external um, site health. So the Big IP Global Traffic Manager is a feature set, and I use that phrase deliberately. It's a feature set which you can obtain either through a specific hardware device from F5 or it can be licensed as a software module on the same Big IP you're using to scale your CAS servers. And so this global traffic manager feature set is built on the same Big IP platform, same administration, same configuration, same kinds of UI, right? Uh, and, and this particular product specializes in keeping in touch with the LTM to understand site health. And then secondly, it uses a, the ability to, uh, to uh, track DNS entries and to provide those DNS um, addresses to clients so that it's always involved in connecting clients to applications. So in this diagram, basically the concept is having two sites, a site A and a site B, with the users coming in and a global traffic manager capability in each of the sites. And if you have a global traffic manager in each of the sites, any one of those sites can go down and the other global traffic manager automatically takes all the load for client requests. So this redirects a client into the applications they need to connect to when one site goes down. Now, obviously, you could, you could have site B um, as a backup site, and you can consider it passive and maybe not place a GTM there. But then if that site went down, there would be no way to fail users from B back to A, right? 
uh, automatically in the same way. And so what we find customers doing is that they tend to fail uh, over from site A to site B for things like maintenance. So once they have a disaster recovery plan in place to handle a one-time uh, critical event, they actually find that the step from there up to being able to do it in a maintenance mode regularly is actually not nearly uh, as complex. And so we're asking you to think about your site resiliency strategy for your business critical applications. Exchange is our example today. And uh, we, find, we think that you'll find that this following information will really help you think about what this means. So if you brought F5 in and said, hey, can you help me with site resiliency for Exchange? What we would be telling you is that some of the critical concepts that you have to have, critical, I would say, requirements in any site resiliency solution are your triggers, right, your trigger mechanisms. So for example, how would you know that Exchange in a site is actually down? What about for users who are outside versus users that are inside the local area network of that data center? So your triggers need to be multi-level and they need to be prioritized. And this gives you the intelligence and the flexibility you need to keep the false positives down. You want to eliminate those false positives and not bounce users unnecessarily, but you absolutely need to know when it's a serious enough event to fail users over to another site. And of course, the local and the global health awareness needs to be available. And you can also consider link state because, uh, you know, for example, F5 can provide you the ability to monitor ISP link state and to actually determine which links need to be supplying traffic in which direction even. And so for those of you who consider ISP link state one of your trigger criteria, um, that's a great time to think about F5. Now, geolocation um, is the next idea to think about. Some users will not, will, will go beyond disaster recovery and failover and actually consider uh, routing users to a particular data center based on their location. Others will have other kinds of business requirements, but one way to do that is to say, well, people east of this line or west of this line or from these states or those states uh, need to go to this particular data center. The idea being users going to their nearest data center not only provides a reasonable, rational division of traffic to spread it, but it also will provide you um, the ability to have the closest, best experience with the, the assumption that the closest closest exchange environment to you from a networking perspective is your best or your home kind of source. And so um, geolocation is a set of features that we offer through the same global traffic manager feature set that we offer uh, for site resilience. We're actually using the Quova database and uh, there are different options for the level of, of detail in the data that can take you beyond the state down into the zip code and even city level and the kinds of data uh, that's available to identify where user traffic is coming from. Of course, uh, these kinds of solutions allow you to do things like localized content targeting. You can do some fraud prevention if you're actually directing external users. So for those of you who have um, more external users slash customers than you have internal employees, your externally facing uh, sites could also use this. This would be sort of outside an exchange environment. But the idea is using territory-based rights management or geolocation data to, to intelligently direct traffic and protect your, envi your environment. Now, <clears throat> let me flip over now, switch gears into security because we want to get into hear from Art and take our Q&A. From a security perspective in, in exchange, there are several areas where F5 can offer you some value. And we're going to pull out from these five bullets here. Um, I mentioned the bidirectional proxy and uh, and I'm, I'm going to focus in on the third one, actually, pre-authentication. And uh, if you have more questions about the rest of these, we certainly would love to go into more detail. But let's talk about pre-authentication today. So most organizations today are in this kind of arrangement where they're connecting users across their network to their key business applications, Exchange and email and being one of them. But they do this in a, an anonymous way, in a lot of ways, for network access. So to, to enable IT to gain more visibility and control over the environment, F5 is seeing customer demand for a richer application delivery option that combines a user context, meaning user identity and their authentication credentials, as well as their authorization, uh, I'll use the word policy. In other words, what rights do they have to particular applications? So how do you identify and authenticate and 
authorized. That's AAA, AAA. You have access, authentication, and authorization to your application. So what we're finding is that the red and the blue circles here are a place where health monitoring, load balancing, um, access, authentication, and authorization, as well as even acceleration, there's another A for you, uh, through the feature sets provided by F5's platform are being used to actually provide, going down through the diagram, an engine-based policy management solution to authorize folks against something like Active Directory. So Exchange is a great place to think about this uh, because uh, Exchange 2010 is offering a lot of services into the edge of your network uh, compared to other versions. And so how do you control that? How do you meet the demand, the rising demand of your users to support things uh, like uh, smartphones, right? So we're talking about, you know, uh, Windows phones, we're talking about Droid devices, iPhones, you know, various kinds of computing platforms that go down, uh, that you can hold in one hand, right? So how do you provide secure and even accelerated access to those devices? That's the concept that we're talking about today. So how this applies to Exchange is that what it's giving you is a simplified way um, to consolidate your infrastructure and provide access, especially over web protocols, to your Exchange environment. We're, we're actually reducing your, the cost to do this triple A by using the platform and Big IP, which is a full layer four to layer seven proxy, and give you even the ability to turn your um, security policies into something that's engine-based. So I used that term once before. That's the difference between using a one-time policy that you need to manually update versus uh, and apply versus a, a, an engine that has a visual policy editor that can apply a policy across your organization or to specific parts of your organization for an application or multiple applications. And that can even be programmed, by the way. So a very rich, very powerful way to gain more control over your environment and to push out some of your AAA into the perimeter. Okay, so as we move on from there, I wanna cover one other point. Um, in the key content area, and that is configuration. So how do you take this big IP, James? How do you take this big IP, you showed me where it plugs into the environment, but how do I take this big IP and get it working? What I'm showing you right now is a screenshot from the big IP UI, which has a list on the left side in blue there of a bunch of different applications that you will recognize, including Exchange 2010. And so we've got a number of, of the most common enterprise business applications that are put into what we call templates. And these templates uh, will actually give you a field by field, here I'm showing you the first screen of the Exchange 2010 template, that prompt you for the key settings for Exchange that are required. The way to think about this is that this is an Exchange-centric configuration for Big IP. So we're not forcing you to take a Big IP centric look at the config. Now, of course, we give you that in our printed deployment guide that's step by step. But this template is a very fast, very easy way to configure your exchange environment on the big IP. And you'll notice that this is one page, and here is two pages. That's it. There's like, I don't know, 15 or so fields that need to be filled out. And uh, you click go, and all of the configuration in the big IP happens automatically. Now, note, look at the scroll bar there up in the upper right. You can tell that I really am not lying. I, I, there's actually a repeat in the screenshot. So you really do not have that many screens. It's just over one viewable page um, on the monitor I was using to get all of those fields in one place. And so customers are finding that their deployment configuration of the big IP is actually one of the easier parts of the deployment. Okay, so let's, let's bring it down now. I'm gonna start to summarize all the concepts that we're bringing in today. Um, and uh, then I'm gonna ask uh, David for one more comment around site resilience. And then I'm gonna um, bring on Art and we're gonna talk a little bit about his experience. So there's been an architecture change in Exchange 2010 that elevates the role of CAS servers or client access servers in providing client access to the inbox. Scalability of that middle tier depends upon a hardware device for a number of reasons, uh, including true application health monitoring, true load balancing and scalability with persistence that keeps users connected, keeps them connected to their email, and extended 
options for the ability to do things like site resilience and geolocation for traffic direction that go beyond just disaster recovery but into truly optimizing your environment to make things like maintenance um, or and your growth across data centers um, even easier, giving you more visibility and control in your environment um, even to the point where we can accelerate and help you secure your environment with the policy engine that allows you to programmatically and uh, with much more power and leverage uh, control the AAA, the access authentication and authorization. So David, before I, before I uh, show the, uh, the document around Microsoft's own recommendations for Exchange and CAS availability, um, I'd like for you to comment just quickly about everything that, what I've said about site resilience and you know, the, the DAG failover versus um, user connections into Exchange. Sure, sure. So um, <clears throat> there's been some interest from, from our customers and certainly in the Microsoft field around leveraging the F5's GTM product to help you know, to to help do our site resilience, right? Where the product today, we don't we don't do any automatic site resilience in terms of you know updating DNS records and 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 pointing your your CAS array names to be the new site, right? So if I lose site A, but I've got some some mailbox servers and copies of my databases, and I've got CAS servers over in site B, Outlook won't automatically update that to use the name of site B. And so how do we do that? And so there's been some interest around GTM from the field. Um, as a way to do that. From a product group perspective, right now they don't actually have much of an opinion um, since this is really outside of what the product does. Um, you know, there's, there's no guidance or, or, or recommended practices there, but as, as part of the Microsoft field, what we're doing and what I'm doing is starting to put together some guidance, work with the product group to get, you know, their, their blessing or their sign off of, of, of some sort, but to be able to come up with a story around how to best leverage, uh, you know, the, the the F5 GTM product and, and, then, and then similar strategies on how to do this. And that's sort of yeah. all that we can say from Microsoft at this point um, is that we're taking a look at it, but maybe yeah. soon. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, David. And, and it really is true that as products go out to the field from Microsoft that, you know, for people like you who get in the field and really do understand and hear the way that customers are running into some challenges, you can kind of bring those things back to corporate and then it kind of you can see uh, updates coming, right, where supported scenarios that emerge that weren't there at RTM, right? Okay, so um, what we're doing now is we're going to move into a quick summary. We want to give you a picture of the ability. Uh, so Microsoft IT has actually published a white paper that you can get. Uh, we're providing you the link, of course. That give, and I pulled out the two places in the document, page 59 and page 70, that give you this diagram and also the comment to reinforce this idea of using a hardware device for high availability of client access. So um, with that, I want to quickly make sure that we move over and speak to Art, because now we, you, you've heard from, from us and uh, David and I, and we want to bring on Art to talk about his experience. So Art, um, uh, are you still there, buddy? I sure am. Great. Thank you for that. So let's start a little bit uh, of background from Sysmax and find out why email is such a critical business application for you. For you. So Sysmax is a, Sysmax America is a subsidiary of Sysmax Japan, and uh, we make blood analyzers and urine analyzers, and deploy them to everything from reference labs to hospitals to um, even some small or to mid-sized doctor offices now. And so it's mission critical for us to have seamless, always-on exchange email contact with our customers um, for support reasons. You know, frankly, if a customer needs to reach us any time or day or night because of any type of instrumentation issue or question, um, you know, we need to make sure that that's seamless for our customers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. I totally understand. Um, that's pretty important business, and it sounds like communication is critical, like for most of our customers, to be able to keep that business running. So what, what are uh, your priorities for upgrading to Exchange 2010, right? So you've already done it. So uh, what were they? So currently we, we're, we're in process of migrating off Exchange 2003, and unfortunately, I know there's somebody from Microsoft on the call, all the promises of high availability on 2003 and 2007 are 
actually in Exchange Server 2010. So, um, and we're also taking advantage of unified messaging. So, you know, not only do we get high availability on voice, you know, email, but also on the voicemail aspect. So we want high availability is, is driving it so that we can have less downtime, less impact to our customers and our, you know, internal clients. I see. I see. So um, let's move into your decision to deploy F5's big IP because clearly you knew that you wanted to move to Exchange 2010. Absolutely, um, yes. How did, that, how did that come about? So actually we were working with our partner, Project Leadership, here in Chicago, and uh, we had an architecture document and we, we had them review it as part of the, the strategy for implementation. And they said, well, this is good, but where's your hardware load balancers? And I said, what hardware load balancers? And so they came back around and they said, well, you know, Microsoft recommends that we put in hardware load, load balancers for the CAS. And so what we did is we said, well, what is Microsoft recommending? And Microsoft actually recommended the F5s, uh, the big IP LTMs. Um, so we put in a pair of 1600s. But in that process, what we did is we reviewed all the other ones that are in a similar cost category, the Barracudas, the Coyote Points, the Comps. We looked at Zeus. And we did a comparative cost analysis and feature analysis. And, you know, the F5s were marginally more expensive than the competition. Um, but as Alton Brown would say, they're multitaskers. Um, I don't like single-use implementation tools. Um, these things truly are multitask tools. So we figured the additional, the, the, and it was a negligible delta between the F5s and these other um, uh, vendor uh, products. So when we looked at that delta towards what we could reuse them for, it was an easy decision. I see, I see. So looking back at the actual experience for your, for your solution deployment, um, and how the F5 devices were kind of brought in. How, how did the, your department there view the investment in F5, you know, as you went through the process? Well, interestingly enough, I'm going I'm to kind of fall back on the, the cost and feature analysis. We reviewed the current issues on the vendor forms for each one of the other products. We checked references. We placed a test support called the F5 before we even bought this, and we reviewed the vendor configuration docs. When we were done with that, we had a lot more confidence in the F5 deployment guide than in any of the other competitor products. Um, using the F5 deployment guide, we were actually up and running without too many headaches. I mean, there were some question marks, um, and we actually, those things that we were had questions on, we called up um, either, uh, we talked to our SE and had a resolution, or called up F5 support and got immediate and direct solutions. So, okay. um, so it sounds like you had a real, a real experience, right? Because as an we, IT person, you know that, that not everything is perfect. Not, yeah, not everything is going to be perfect based on your environment. So we had a real experience that was pleasant. It wasn't fraught with headaches. And, you know, now that we're here and running, um, th there are no outages. Um, and, and what's very interesting that we're doing, too, is we use the SNMP monitoring um, to actually reach in and uh, with the MIBs to keep track of what's going on with the F5s so that, you know, we do have solid monitoring with that so we can look and see the exchange servers are running fine, the F5s are running fine, there are no issues. Excellent, excellent. So how does that impact your, the way that you do maintenance? You were talking about things not going down. That's in production. So how do you handle maintenance? So I, the only time a user is ever going to see, you know, a disconnect message is a user that has public folders um, because that actually goes back to uh, the mailbox servers and not the CAS. I think I saw a question uh, from one of the, uh, the attendees on that. Um, and I don't understand the decision, but it's not my decision. Um, that's the only thing, only time they may actually see an outage. We were actually to, able to update, you know, one CAS server at a time, reboot, bring it back up, update another CAS server, go back to the DAG, move all the databases over, update a mailbox server, reboot it, bring it back up, move all the databases over. Um, you know, complete updates on that other mailbox server, bring it back up, share out the databases between the two servers, and the users do not see any type of downtime, and email is seamless. Great. Great. Thank you for that testimony. That's great. We're very happy with, with, um, 
with, with that testimony and the ability for F5 and, and Microsoft to... And even from an F5 standpoint, because we have a pair of 1600s, we're able to push new code if we need to push new code to one load balancer, do a reboot, come back up, push it to the other one, come, you know, have it come back up, and we see no downtime. Excellent. That's excellent. So um, any additional thoughts you wanted to leave with them about, you know, your experience or, or with your choice in F5? So, you know, based, I've seen some questions there on the Q&A, and I'm sure the, uh, the Microsoft speaker did, is going to have some, and I know he can't speak to it, but we are planning to reutilize re these um, for our upcoming link deployment, our production link deployment. Um, for hardware load balance, and we're also going to be doing it for our external facing SharePoint um, for hardware load balancing as well for our SharePoint internet servers. So, I mean, when I said multitasker, I really mean it. We're going to get a lot more bang for the buck out of these products than anything else we could have chosen. Excellent. Thank you, Art. I appreciate that. And thank you so much for, for sharing your time. So, for everyone, Art has graciously agreed to stay with our Q&A session. And it looks like we have quite a number of questions coming up. And so um, as long as he can, he'll stay on the line, although uh, we are running up close to our time. So thank you, Art, for that. And um, Good. So what we'll, what we'll do now is we're going to run through the rest of this. So start, start thinking about, for those of you who haven't asked a question yet, what your question might be. I just want to summarize by saying that F5 and Microsoft have a solution for you around Exchange 2010. Um, not only high availability within a site, but across sites are, are things that you need to think about. Um, we can definitely make your environment more efficient and give you more visibility and more control over it. And then, uh, you know, we're here to help. You know, we're here to help you with your design, and we're going to leave you with these uh, email addresses here, my email address at j.hendergaard at f5.com, David's from Microsoft, as well as a Microsoft partnership at F5. The customer teams from F5 are ready to meet with you, and you can definitely um, get a copy of this presentation and interact with us following this event. And, uh, you know, based on the number of questions that I'm seeing, it looks like we're going to have to um, find a way to actually project out the answers to all these questions so we don't have time to answer them all, but I do want to answer them. So we'll be working with Ziff after this to uh, maybe post a link to a place where we can get some answers. But I wanted to make sure that you guys knew that your questions are excellent. I'm looking through them now. They're great questions. And we will answer as much of them as we can in this recording. Uh, before we need to sign off so that there's a recorded copy of the event available. And so um, as we move to that, I just wanted to make one more comment about getting out and engaging with Microsoft and F5. We have a number, um, Microsoft has a number of technology centers around the U.S. that are available. There are also worldwide offices in case there's anyone calling in from Europe or Asia uh, or South America. We've got these um, 12 or 13 sites in the U.S. that are all open and ready for you to engage with locally. And F5 equipment is in those sites, and we're able to engage directly with you. And as you can see, it's quite a nice a demo facility to do everything from vision and business strategy down to architectural design and proof of concept. Okay, so I'm going to pop up these resource slides here so that Dave and I can go through them, and then we'll tackle uh, the question. So um, <clears throat> what we've got for you is, first of all, a printed version of, of our experience with F5 and Microsoft Exchange 2010. And then we also have a video demo that goes through the configuration of Big IP for Exchange um, there for you um, online. And then we've also got our deployment guidance and our, our top-line uh, solution information page on our website. It's interesting to know that F5 has an online user community for asking and answering many of the same questions that were asked today in the webcast. And so if you, if you pop up to that link at devcentral.f5.com, you'll find a topic group there for Microsoft Solutions. And that's where our, my team engages to help answer your questions. And that goes for technical as well as business uh, related questions. So, um, David, why don't you give us a quick overview of your links here, and then we'll get into the questions. Sure thing. Um, so certainly the next link there is the technical white paper on how Microsoft does or did Exchange 2010 internally. And obviously we have a lot of customers that are very interested in, in uh, excuse me, how Microsoft IT rolls out our products internally to our global environment as well as, um, y you know, how we support this stuff, I suppose. Um, the next link there is load balancing requirements from Microsoft TechNet. That's, that's product documentation on Microsoft TechNet, uh, specifically addressing each of the different modalities and, and how are the, the product group uh, you know, recommends doing that. And then the final link is, is probably one of the more useful ones that you'll want to bookmark, is actually to a, to a spot on, on the TechNet wiki that another MCM uh, or 
Exchange Ranger Unric Walter has been uh, managing, which is uh, links to best practices, um, recommended practices on how to set up your load balancers, as well as links to some, some of the videos, the product documentation, the, again, these, the, uh, the same MSIT link, as well as configuration guides for all of the, all of the major load balancer vendors. F5 is, I think, the first one on that list. Um, so that you can, you know, get an easy jumping point to their configuration document, which is very good and goes into very in-depth detail on how to configure the big IP devices, the LTMs, for doing exchange. So definitely that last one is uh, going to be a link that you want to bookmark and keep in your back pocket for future reference. Excellent. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. So thank you, everyone. We realize that some of you are having to go off to your other meetings. What we're going to do is stay here on the line and answer as many of these questions audibly as we can to get them in the recording, and then we'll send you a link to that. What I can say for sure, though, is that we have a good mix of questions that we'll answer in an audio fashion based on the information provided, and another mix of some of you that are running into specific questions around, say, a uh, persistence type configuration that will be great for our Dev Central community and, uh, or a personal face-to-face -face engagement with one of our field engineers to talk through that. So um, for those of you that need to leave, just know that we're going to talk through as many of these questions as we can. For those of you who have a specific question, please take that question and post it to the F5 topic group uh, for Microsoft Solutions on devcentral.f5.com. All right, so let's uh, run through a couple of these questions. It looks to me like the first one from Felix, uh, it says, Does, can this device from F5 be used for other applications? Absolutely. You absolutely um, heard that from Art and OCS and Link are both supported, um, including those templates that I, that I provided. Now, another question that I saw in the mix was, how do I get the templates? Today, the templates are available in the operating system of the Big IP, and you do need the, late, the latest version, either 10.1 or 10.2.1, uh, to get the latest version for Exchange 2010. Uh, now, for those of you running the 9x code base, it's still, the deployment guidance is still valid in terms of load balancing, health monitoring, and persistence. However, the templates are in the latest version. Okay. Now, um, there's another question here around supporting load balancing for, for Hub and HA. That's a little bit deeper dis discussion around um, how you want to do that design and what ports and protocols are decided. And so I'll take just one more here um, before we officially go into our post meeting when we're just going to talk through the answers with our experts to get it recorded. And that's, um, uh, you know, uh, is, there, is there a noticeable performance impact on F5 LTM when you're offloading SSL and then re-encrypting, okay? So that, what he's saying is that you take the certificate off exchange and put it on uh, the big IP for connections coming in, and then you re-encrypt with another certificate on the big IP back to exchange. So the exchange server actually does keep a cert, but you've got um, a couple of certs on the big IP. So the, there is an overhead to our a async processor chipset, um, but there's not, there's not a mainline load on our primary CPU for the actual crypto calculation. The mainline CPU is for doing the primary logic. So for example, depending on your requirement for inspecting a packet and performing uh, maybe an injection into the header or um, manipulating it in some other way, um, that would have an overhead, but it wouldn't necessarily be directly related to the SSL part. So what you do in your sizing is you'd work with our field engineers to size for both the mainline uh, LTM or local traffic manager features and functions, as well as sizing for the SSL offload with the async chipset. Okay, so um, thank you, David and Art. If you can stay on, please. We're just going to run through these questions um, through the recording, and uh, so our listeners can pick these up later. And, uh, and this is Sal. I want to thank everyone for participating. Uh, thank you, Microsoft and F5, for uh, sponsoring this. And uh, for people that are uh, leaving the, uh, the, 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 the audio part of this, uh, there's a number of things you can download on the way out. There's a, a link to uh, some of our upcoming events, and there's also a survey we'd like you to fill out. So thank you all for participating. So now we'll move into the post-conference here to run through many of these questions uh, as quickly as we can. <clears throat> so we'll look at um, number 51 there from Todd. When will there be an F5 technology site in Western Canada? So thank you so much, Todd, for the request. It's requests like these that build the case for just that. I don't have an official roadmap for you, but watch closely from F5 uh, for any announcements about that kind of thing in the future. For now, we'd love to have you in Seattle, or our local teams in Western Canada would love to come and meet with you. If you need a proof of concept, we'll find a way to get that done for you. 
Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, what is the number? It's number 50. What is the number or user number of, a, of appliances ratio for the F5 solution? Is there a roadmap to choose between models? That question is best answered by engaging with F5 locally, directly, so that we can understand your entire environment and provide the right kinds of sizing guidance. We definitely have a model roadmap uh, for you that actually um, can help you to size the equipment properly based on uh, your situation. The next one is uh, we'd like to schedule a demo in Chicago. Um, Brian, definitely. We've got people in Chicago. In fact, there's somebody in my office right now from Chicago that uh, is very happy to hear that you'd like to do a demo. We've got work in the Microsoft Technology Center as there as well. So let's get together with your local F5 team and we'll put that together. Uh, let's see, any recommendations from number 48? Recommendations for deploying with BlackBerry Enterprise Server and all the default exchange settings sufficient. So I'll cover the F5 piece first and then I'll ask David if there's, if there's anything special he wants to add. So for BlackBerry Enterprise Server, it's a great question because that server does initiate additional connections and we have in our uh, deployment guidance and that video that I mentioned for configuring Big IP, um, specific BlackBerry configuration. We basically have to configure some SNAT settings to ensure that the number of connections you need um, are supported. And so it's a rather small change, but it is a change um, that would be beyond our template in 10.2.1. Um, and so you need to think about that. And our printed deployment guide goes through this. So David, do you have any comments around BlackBerry Enterprise Server? Sure. Um, so with regard to BlackBerry Enterprise Server, we generally recommend following RIMS guidance on making sure that you have the latest version of BlackBerry Enterprise Server that's supported for either Exchange 2010 RTM or Exchange 2010 SPU1. And I think there's some SPU1 support that is still um, <laughs> forthcoming from RIM. Beyond that, if you look at the Microsoft Exchange Team, yeah, if you look at the Microsoft Exchange Team blog on uh, msexchangeteam.com, there is a post you get a search for a while back that talks about some things that you'll want to update in your throttling policies. Uh, because otherwise, as, as James mentioned, the, the BEZ server to us looks like one client with a whole mess of connections coming in, and so by default, the Exchange 2010 throttling policies will throttle back BlackBerry, and if you've got uh, VIPs or executives on Blackberries that then get throttled, that doesn't work out so well. Um, so you do want to make sure that, that you follow our guidance on setting up a new throttling policy and sign your, your, your BEZ service account to that throttling policy that actually will basically unthrottle uh, the BEZ account and then let BlackBerry do its work. Excellent. Thank you. Can I, can I add to that? Sure, Art. There's an excellent TechNet article out there right now, GG670940, um, that relates specifically to Exchange 2010 Service Pack 1 and uh, BlackBerry Enter Enterprise Server that's just very, very good. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Could you give us those letters again, and we'll make sure we get the link into our... G is in George, G is in George, 670-940, and I can email that to you, James. Perfect. Thank you, Art. Mm -hmm. We'll get that link out. Appreciate it. So next question is number 47 from Dave. Uh, Dave says, any special requirements when the CAS hub are on the same server with F5, mailbox or separate? Nope, there are no special requirements. Uh, number 46 are there two, there are two F5 1600s, are they going to export, uh, support Exchange and Link? So yes, those devices support more than one app, but to size the device to your environment, you need to engage with your local F5 team to take all factors into consideration, okay? But on the whole, the device itself is, is designed with throughput maximums and computing capacity for multiple apps. Number 45, um, Joel asks, how does licensing work to enable further applications other than Exchange to be aware by F5? So F5 licensing is by feature, not by application. So if you have the, the features that you purchase with the F5 are available to anything for any traffic you want to run through the device. Great question. Do you, number 44, do you have any documentation that explains the features that are superior on F5 appliances compared to competition? That's a great time to engage our local team as well. Of course, of course we do, um, and F5 uh, definitely has a great story to tell uh, versus um, you know, mo anybody out there. So we'd love to engage with you locally. Um, number 43, Todd asks, how many email users does Sysmex have? So Art, what's your total now? We currently are about 900, 925 for total user mailboxes. That's not, great. Not, now that's not users, that's just mailboxes. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. Okay. User count is probably closer to 750, but we have mailboxes for everything, and I'm sure everybody understands how that works too. There you go. Thank you. 
Mm-hmm. All right, Jason asks, uh, what rigor or process is done for the maintenance tasks that Arthur has? <laughs> so, Arthur, what, what are you prepared to talk about? Well, here, I mean, what we did is we looked actually at the Exchange 2010 TechNet documentation on update and maintenances. And so what we do is we actually roll maintenance in a specific order based on Exchange 2010 documentation, which is roll the CAS servers first, then roll the mailbox servers, because we have a CAS hub transport shared environment. So what we do is we actually do the DAG witness CAS first, then we do the the second CAS, then we do the first mailbox after we roll the mailboxes over to the other mailbox server, or act, you know, they're pushing activity over to the other server, run updates, push it back, run updates. When we were in the pilot of this, um, the, the rigor that we went through is we actually just turned power off on servers to make sure that we were up and running. Yeah, okay. Um, and we literally pulled power on F5s to make sure we were up and running, which would be the worst case scenario. Like, could that actually happen in the data center here? I don't think so. But, you know, stranger things have happened. Absolutely. Great answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So number 41, um, I talked to this already about the version of the TMOS operating system on the big IPs. Um, Technically, the core load balancing features are supported on 9X, but you won't get the templates. And if you're looking at using the the, uh, security-based features that I was talking to you about, uh, you'll, you'll want to move to the latest version of the operating system. So what I'm saying is that Exchange is a great reason for you to consider upgrading your operating system. In the last um, 18 months, we've made a number of additions that would be beneficial to you, but the core load balancing uh, piece and the deployment guidance from the past uh, will apply uh, to that version. James, uh, if it makes any yeah. difference, we are running 10.2.x here at Sysmax. Oh, you are? Okay, perfect. Thank that you, That's correct. Mm-hmm. Number uh, 41, from, uh, we're currently running, see, I covered that one. Number 40, um, where are the exchange templates? <laughs> are they in 9.4? So I just answered that one. They're not in 9.4. Um, you'll want to get 10.2.x for the latest exchange template. Uh, the uh, Number 39 is, are the virtual appliances available for use in training and lab? Absolutely. Uh, we do have availability of virtual appliances, and uh, you should be paying attention to F5 in the coming days as well for more information about that. And you can, you can contact your local F5 team uh, if you want to talk about that a little bit more. Okay, number 38 from Jason. Is there a recommended version of TMOS? Same question. Number 36, yep, same question. Number 35, Sergio, can I use GTM for CAS redirection to another data center because I don't have any DAG server member from data center 1 in data center 2? So from a client to CAS connection perspective, absolutely you could do that if you have CAS servers in your backup data center. Uh, Of course, what you you got, the obvious statement here is that recognize that you're actually decoupling, or sorry, you're distancing your CAS servers from the mailbox, which which can have an impact on performance. So uh, David, do you have a particular recommendation for them around that? Well, with regard to how the, I mean, how, how the question was, was asked, and, and, and unfortunately we don't have a whole lot of interactive dialogue here, if you don't have any, any DAG members in Data Center 2, I'm wondering what the value is. If, if the WAN goes down or, the, or Data Center 1 goes down and your user mailboxes are in Data Center 1, which isn't available anymore, I'm, I'm not certain I see the benefit of using GTM to redirect CAS to the other site. If you are having only you know, active-passive CAS pools, and you've got mailboxes in both sites, then there may be some, some value there, but uh, you also may consider setting up another CAS server array and another LTM, GTM pool to send those Data Center 2 users to Data Center 2 CAS and vice versa. So there's potentially some, some design questions and dialogue that, that should happen there that unfortunately we don't have the ability to do here. Yeah, absolutely, so thank you for that. Sergio, definitely try to reach out to, to you know even Microsoft and F5 for sure, what we can we can talk to you further as well, and you know maybe Microsoft can help you with with your your data um, your data tier planning there. Okay, number thirty four is can site resilience be implemented with LTM or is it only available on GTM? Yeah, site resilience um, the the DNS features are in GTM itself, but remember there are software features uh, that can be, can be licensed on the same device if you support multiple feature sets on the on the box. So yeah, that's a GTM specific. Number thirty three is um, uh, being an Exchange admin, are there tools that can provide a view-only visibility to real-time and reporting into the health and configuration of LTM and GTM, like saturation levels? We don't do our own network 
it's managed by a vendor. Yeah. So the question here is, how do I really pull all the data out of the F5 device in a way that I can report and see on it in my exchange kind of view? So there's a couple different answers to that question. Um, some of the, the real-time information that we have can definitely be pulled off and used with a third party like Splunk or whatever to analyze it deeply. And then there are other kinds of ways to pull that information, um, if not just logging into the box, um, but actually programmatically through things like um, PowerShell scripting integration, uh, either, either to a, something custom that you build or, or using something like System Center Operations Manager. Art, I think you said you're using SNMP, is that right? Yeah, we use PRTG tied okay. in with the SNMP MIBs to pull, the, pull information out. Right. So SNMP, our iControl interface, .NET, PowerShell scripting, all those things are ways to do that. That might be a great professional services um, uh, opportunity here where my F5 consultants could actually help you figure this part out. And I know that we have a great team working with Bank of America. So hopefully, Randy, that will help you get going in the right direction. Um, number 32, what's the optimum way to health monitor CAS? That's all documented in our deployment guide. Um, we definitely, it's by client type and port and protocol. And it says step by step exactly what we monitor in that deployment guide. The link is in the back of the presentation. Number 31, uh, why not use route health injection instead of GTM? That's definitely dependent on uh, your situation. And so uh, we're going to say, hey, reach out to us um, directly there, and we can talk to you a little bit about that. I have one. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, this is Michael Koichman. I'm a solution architect with F5. And the simple answer to the question is, obviously, route health injection works, but it's uh, reliant on the routing protocols, which have no visibility into monitoring. The intelligence of GTM allows it to interact with LTMs to find out the capacity and capabilities of LTMs across various data centers and know the capacity and availability, while route health injection is only capable of injecting routes but does not know the state of the actual application at that location. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, number 30 is uh, on slide 8, the diagram showed SMTP traffic goes through edge and hub, not through big IP. Can we redirect SMTP through big IP? What a great question. Yeah, we didn't talk about the flow of email. We talked about the, the connection of clients into CAS so they can get their inbox. But the actual flow of mail over SMTP is something that F5 can support. From our perspective, SMTP is obviously one of the protocols we support. And we do find that in some of our larger customers who do deploy uh, the edge role for Exchange, they tend to use um, F5 to load balance the mail, uh, SMTP mail, through that edge farm to make sure that it's equally spread. Okay, uh, number 29 is for the virtual server settings for a combined um, client. These are all various client type connections. We've used the deployment guide, and it's a cookie persistence question. So this is Matt. I'm going to point you over to devcentral.f5.com. Uh, we definitely have um, an answer that we can post up there for you, working with persistence profiles for the various clients. So um, it depends on your environment and what you're doing, and so it's, it's hard to give one answer uh, in this format. So thank you for that. Um, James, yep. I need to jump in. Uh, the recording's going to end oh, it is? Uh, in okay. a few minutes. Yeah, so we need to really uh, wrap up. up. Uh, okay. they, they cut us off automatically. All right. so. We're going to skip past um, the to 25, which is an SSL cert stored in FIPS, and is it compliant? So Michael's going to take that question. Yeah, absolutely. So we have FIPS compliant devices which store SSL certificate in FIPS, and uh, that's independent of any application. So. We, we absolutely can have this compliant exchange SSL upload. Great. Thank you. David, I want to say thank you. David Zazzo has got to leave um, right now, so thank you so much, David, for your help. Thank you. And Art, um, as well, um, I appreciate you staying online. Thanks. If you need to go, um, you definitely you can, yep. you can. James, I cleared my schedule for you. Okay. Thank you, Art. And for everyone else, Art is a... Uh, yeah, here for us. Thank you so much. So uh, we're going to take a question on uh, remote client IP address for um, auditing the CAS servers, only seeing source IPs from big IP. How do you pass the remote client to CAS? Those are, those are questions we're going to tackle in Dev Central with you um, or through a local engagement, David. It's a little bit too detailed for this particular format. Same for number 22, um, but we are there is a question around public folders there. And uh, it looks like there's some questions around that. So unfortunately, we're not having a lot of time to get into that one either. So devcentral.f5.com um, and your local F5 team, and we will, we will tackle that for you. Um, 
The mapping connection question around number 21 is actually a good one. So, um, you know, we definitely help you with Mappy. Um, and so Mappy's running over RPC. We can do some things there around RPC. Um, there, there are um, uh, definitely, we manage that traffic, we load balance it, and um, we can, and that particular connection is already stateful in and of itself. Um, and so we definitely um, can help you with, you know, making sure that persistence is working properly. The acceleration pieces that happen over the web protocols don't happen in a MAPI connection, right? And so, um, and you're not using things like cookies, for example, but um, definitely the MAPI client um, we handle. So uh, thank you for that one. And then um, uh, just a general question about application awareness. The application awareness is on a portent protocol level based on the client connection type. And for all of the monitors that we have in our device to configure by client type, that's in our deployment guide and in our templates, they'll all automatically be used to drive that as traffic uh, delivery decisions. Okay, uh, questions about, I see questions about um, uh, 1600 supporting all the features for Exchange. Yes, except it's only going to support one module at a time, so that's one feature set, meaning if you want global site resilience, that's the GTM. You'll have to upgrade to a 3600 device or have an, an additional device, an additional 1600 for that functionality. Um, there's some other questions in here around OA strings and some uh, uh, general guidelines around when to upgrade from product to product. I just gave that answer around the module um, question, the feature sets, but your local customer F5 customer team can help you with that. The OA strings are definitely dependent on your environment. Um, we definitely have a lot of flexibility around what you're doing. How does our offering different from Citrix NetScaler? Um, we could spend a lot of time on that, but let me, I'll just give you a couple of pointers. Um, number one, when, when consultants come in to design Exchange, we've had, we had a Microsoft consultant come in. It wasn't David who was on with us earlier, but another consultant said, look, my Exchange design uh, offering is three days. I will come in at my billing rate per hour for three days and be done if F5 is yeah. there. If it's Citrix, it's three weeks. So the question back is, do you want to spend that $30,000 extra on something very core like making an application delivery controller provide high availability to CAS, or do you want to spend that on something that's actually directly related to your line of business, or even better, not spend it at all? So that's, that's just a high-level overview. The Citrix NetScaler devices are, are primarily designed for some kinds of uh, web kind of traffic handling. Um, and they're definitely not built from the ground up to handle net any network traffic like the F5 devices. You open up the F5 device, it's not a PC, okay? So uh, I can't say enough about the differences between the two, but we'd love to talk to you if you have more questions. Number 14, uh, what are my limitations around uh, version number of TMOS? We covered that. And it looks like um, we've got a couple other questions about public folders, and we've got um, some questions around the deployment guide itself. Again, I'll point you back to the deployment guide, Dev Central, um, for sure, to enter those questions. So I'm going to wrap that up and say thank you, everyone, for all of these great questions, and uh, uh, thank you for your time today.